This is Sarah Novke. Hey, this is Samuel Peralta. And- hey, this is Andy Pelliquin. This is M.A. Phipps, and you're listening to 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston, Preston Lay. Woohoo! Hey, everybody. Welcome to a special Friday edition of 30 Minute Author Interviews. We've got a great one for you today. But first up, I want to tell you about two of our sponsors. First is Cereal Box. Cereal Box delivers exciting episodes of ongoing stories straight to your device every Wednesday. They bring everything that's awesome about TV to what's already cool about books with addicting cereals you can take with you on the go. All of their episodes are available in text and audio, and their sleek app makes reading easier than ever. They have a range of titles from gritty urban thrillers to sexy sword fighting fantasies and everything in between. Season 2 of The Witch Who Came In From The Cold just started up. The Witch Who Came In From The Cold, all the subterfuge of the Americans with a dark dose of magic. Head on over to SerialBox.com where you can read and listen to it now. And of course, the first episode of Season 1 is free, so you can check it out there. SerialBox.com, S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X.com. Our second sponsor this week is the Galactic Satori Chronicles, written by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. A thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in this adrenaline-pumping new series. Asher is a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancé's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. In a desire to better understand humans in order to destroy them, these aliens are projecting their consciousness into unsuspecting men and women and in the process are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Fueled by emotions that the aliens will never understand, Asher bands together with a group of friends. These four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Asher takes the fight from Earth to an alien spaceship, and then to the very planet of the enemy trying to destroy them. Galactic Satori Chronicles can be found on Amazon, where Book 1 Earth and Book 2 Kron are only 99 cents. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. Actually, today we're not actually interviewing an author. We are interviewing uh, possibly one of – well, not possibly – my favorite audiobook narrator, Michael Kramer. Uh, Thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. Well, thank you for having me. Not a problem. Um, We start out each episode here with a segment that we call Two Truths and a Lie. So if you could, can you tell me – Two truths and a lie about yourself, and I'll see if I can get it right. Okay, I think I sent this to you on email, but um, yes. homeschooled uh, through sixth grade, worked in a turkey factory, but still love turkey, and uh, would love to live by a lake. They're, they all sound so. <laughs> they all sound true. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> man, for so. For some reason, I, actually, there's really no reason. Um, I'm thinking you would love to live by a lake is the lie. I have a feeling maybe you maybe you live by one. I don't know. So I'm going to say you you would love to live by a lake is the lie. Uh, actually, that's very true. Oh, I, I grew up in Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes. But with the town that I grew up in was a little town called Lucan, about 250 people set on the Southwest Plains, 13 miles from where Plum Creek is, if you're a Laura Ingalls Wilder reader, Mm -hmm. and Little House on the Prairie fame, and not a lake for about 25 miles. (laughs) Wow. Uh, The the lie is I was homeschooled. Uh, I was not homeschooled, although I went to a very, very tiny Catholic grade school uh, until sixth grade. No kindergarten. Uh, Didn't have kindergarten back then, I know. Uh, And uh, uh, my mother's actually a teacher, but uh, but you know I went through regular school and then college and grad school and all that. But growing up on the plains in Minnesota was uh, I was desperate to be near a lake. But um, 
you know, and we go to vacation near a lake, but never grew up there. I grew up, uh, the town I grew up in, my, my father's father had uh, 12 siblings, eight of which were uh, brothers. They actually had a fam- very famous, uh, the Kramer family band uh, back in the early 1900s in southwest Minnesota. And uh, my f- father's mother was one of 13 as well. And uh, uh, so <laughs> most of southwest Minnesota is related to me in one way or another. My, <laughs> my, my brother would come home. And he'd say, I met this girl. And then, yeah, she's your cousin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that was funny. always the, that was always the issue there. But no, I, it was a great way to grow up. Um, I have to say that, uh, you know, in a small town, I, I couldn't tell you where our house key was. I think we locked I think we locked our house when we went on vacation. I don't know where we kept the key. We used to keep the keys to the car in the car. <laughs> Uh, uh, until uh, my youngest brother had a habit of climbing into the car and, and wanting to drive, and our driveway was slightly on a hill, and he would throw the car into gear, and it would slide down the driveway into our neighbor's yard. And so eventually we had to put the keys, you know, uh, on the visor. But otherwise we would never know where the keys were. Uh, so it was a, it was a kind of an idyllic way to grow up. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, wow. So, so you used to peel gizzards at a turkey factory. That's correct. Um, yeah, one uh, one summer, uh, this is back in the early '80s. Uh, I worked in a turkey processing plant, and for the first day, and we set a record for how many birds. I think we did sixteen thousand birds that day. Oh wow! And I was one of four people peeling gizzards that day, uh, and then they shifted me to a, a different job the next day. Uh, I had rehearsal that night. Uh, after that first day for a play called, I think, My Three Angels, which was uh, eventually made into a movie with Humphrey Bogart way back when. Um, And I can remember I was so tired because I got up at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning for the job, and it was at rehearsal, you know, 14 hours later. And I'm looking down, I'm holding my script, and I'm I'm kind of fading in and out, and all of a sudden I'm looking down at the pages, and I'm going, that's a gizzard, and I was about to peel it. And I was like, no, no, stop that, stop that. (laughs) Um, But no, I still love turkey. Um, uh, that was a great job in terms of of um, teaching me a whole bunch about uh, the kind of exposure that factory workers have to kind of repetitive injury type situations and how you really need to keep yourself healthy uh, and how hard that is to do given you know the hours and all of that. Um, but uh, yeah, I still love turkey. <laughs> that's, fun. that's funny. <laughs> yeah. You still love turkey yeah. because of it, but yeah, that's funny. Um, well, for just in case any of my readers might not know who you are, or what you do, can you, can you give them kind of a bio on who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, uh, I narrate audiobooks. Um, I have been uh, narrating since about 1991. Uh, probably most uh, – I've done a whole range of books. I don't keep track. Uh, Sean Pratt, a <laughs> friend of mine, keeps track of how many books he's done. I think he's in the 700s. I might be – not too far behind him or ahead of him. I'm not sure. I don't, don't worry too much about that. Um, some of the authors I've done, uh, Brandon Sanderson uh, and uh, Robert Jordan, uh, my wife and I uh, did the Wheel of Time series. Um, we're currently doing the Storm, uh, Stormlight Archive, uh, among others. We did the V.E. Schwab, uh, I think it's Shades of Magic series. Mm-hmm. Um uh, worked with many, many, many different authors. Both of us also work with the Library of Congress Talking Books program. Uh, so there's a whole range of material there that uh, would not be necessarily available to commercial uh, subscribers of, of audiobooks. It's only available to those who are qualified for the uh, Talking Books program for the blind and physically handicapped. Um, but that's a free service. I'm going to pump that now just because uh, it seems to be one of the best kept secrets in the country. It's a free service for blind and physically handicapped. And that can be as simple as um, dyslexia. It can be I broke my arm. I can't turn the page. So, you know, you can qualify on a short term basis for that program. Uh, you can qualify as you get older, you know, in terms of if you have trouble holding the book, if you're dyslexic, if you have any kind of reading issue, sight issues. Uh, but just to and that you can contact, just go to, to the Library of Congress Talking Books website and they will 
take you in and, and, and you can now, now download things as easily to your phone if you want with them. Um, uh, a whole range of authors. Um, I, I'm very blessed in that, uh, uh, one of the early authors I worked with was Robert, uh, or excuse me, um, Donald E. Westlake, who also wrote, uh, under the name of Richard Stark. Um, so I, I did, and it, some of these have been reissued now because the original rights ran out and different companies have, uh, taken them, but I did the whole Dortmunder series up through bad news. And then, um, uh, and another company got the rights and so they continued with their own people. Um, and, uh, with Richard Stark, I did uh, as, you know, I wanted to do all, I did all the Parker series except the last one, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then all of the Ellen Grofield series. But I think Donald E. Westlake was one of those authors for me that, that really shaped how I grew as a narrator. You know, it, it, it's interesting now because if I feel like it's come full circle in that, uh, in the last four or five years, I've been working with a lot of self-published, uh, uh, writers like, uh, Jacob Cooper, um, uh, and or, um, uh, and James Islington. And, you know, starting out as a narrator, it's, it's a craft, you know, and like any craft, you know, they, you, you have to put in those, like those 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I, I would probably cringe right now for some of the early books that I did just in terms of te <laughs> technique because it's it's it is a craft it's hard um uh and you learn um I I had my intro to the whole business was um a good friend of mine uh Grover Gardner whom I think uh, uh if you're an audiobook person you know Grover's name he's constantly uh, recording a whole range of material as well he is a, one of my best friends and uh he needed an engineer <laughs> so I would come in uh, and be his engineer, and then the studio he worked in had about five, four or five other narrators, and they needed engineers. And so pretty soon I was coming in on a regular basis um, to be the engineer for all these people. So for about three years, uh, while I was doing my acting work and all, all the other jobs you need to do as a, a theater artist to kind of put bread on the table, uh, I listened to people read. And, uh, it was, you know, first of all, uh, when you're listening to one of the best in the industry, um, that's, that's just an amazing, uh, experience because you, you know, you're making mental notes. Oh, I can do that. Oh, that's, how, oh, that's how you handle that. Oh, oh, oh. You know, so there's constantly, you're, you're learning the technique and you're seeing how you can switch from from narrative voice to character voice or switching character voices on a dime. Um, and when that works and when it doesn't work or how to approach this, uh, a section of narrative as opposed to a section of dialogue, uh, which I think for actors, that's one of the hardest things to, is, is determining the, the narrative voice. Uh, that's really the spine of the book in many cases. Um, and, and figuring out how that has to interact with the, with the, uh, the dialogue with the characters. And so for three years I did that. And then, um, the studio director, who was also a narrator, Flo Gibson, um, who, again, if you are in, into audiobooks, she was a giant in the early days and her, her niche was, uh, often the kind of lost and forgotten, uh, 19th century writers who, um, in some cases were starting to being pushed out of libraries because of shelf space. But she wanted to make sure that those, those not so, you know, classic titles were being recorded as well. Um, she saw me in a play and said, you need to audition for an audiobook." And so I sent in an audition and went, sent the, an audition to two different companies and, uh, came back about uh, two weeks later with two different books uh, from two different companies and uh, haven't really turned back since. Um, uh, and the industry has changed just so tremendously back from when I started in the early 90s. It was still kind of, at that point, uh, I worked, oh, Books on Tape was uh, the main company that I worked with. And uh, and that's what we did. It was, you know, it was, it was Books on Tape. It was, that was the medium. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was the, the advent of the audio cassette for the car that changed the whole marketing because up until then, you know, 
you really couldn't listen to an audio book other than if you were, you know, at home. Um, but once you could put a cassette in a car, all of a sudden, and then you add, add to that, you know, a Walkman. Um, so now you can take it when you go for a run and whatever. And now the, the instant download to your phone, to your computer, to whatever, pretty soon I think they probably have a chip in your head where you can just go, okay, bang, you know, click to your back teeth twice and uh, download the next book. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but that just transformed the business and it just kind of exploded in terms of uh, the, of, you know, when, it, when, you, when you can get your product to the c- consumer that much easier it, it, because it was uh, so frustrating, I think, for people who, and I, I know this because you'd order a book and, you know, it, all of a sudden your one cassette would all of a sudden be faulty. And so you're in the middle of a 12 cassette book. So uh, uh, say a 14 hour book and eight hours in the tape has been chewed up and you're like, but the story, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, uh, and then you'd have to wait, you'd have to send the tape back and then they'd have to do this. And, and, you know, it could be a week to two weeks before you finally get another a cassette to continue the story and it was just uh and now it's i know there are, i know there are some download issues sometimes but for the most part it's almost instant in terms of yeah you you know you get the you get the book you want the book you get it that day you get it that almost that minute mm-hmm. yeah and then and then you know now with uh Amazon and it's uh I forget what they call it the syncing that it does between ebook and audiobook. I mean, you can read it, then go get in your car, it knows exactly where you left off and then you can get to your office and open on the computer and it knows where you stopped on your phone and yep. yeah, yep. it's amazing. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that's that was the start um uh, of my career. Uh you know, again, I I feel very blessed with the fact that uh I've encountered the authors that I have. Um you know, uh, as I say, Donnelly, the reason I say Donnelly was they kind of really shaped me. There were actually two things I, I did. The third book I did, and I say book, it's I was actually it was a series. It was the Kent family series by John Jakes. This was an eight volume. Close to 8000 page uh, historical fiction, uh, and he started writing it. Uh, he had started writing it before the centennial or the bicentennial Uh uh, you know, in 1776, and uh, it, you know, it basically tracked this family from their origins, which it, were as as uh, colonial colonialists, up through the Civil War, up and through the Civil War, and you meet all the historical figures along the way. You meet George Washington. You meet, you know, uh, had uh, Jackson. You meet uh, uh, Eli Whitney. You meet all these, you know. They would, somehow he would weave it so that you always had one branch of the family in the right place to come across some American historical figure. Um, and the challenge of that was, you know, first of all, all the accents that came in and, and the fact that it was thousands of characters. And how do you handle that? And what are you going to do to, to differentiate, uh, differentiate them vocally? So that was the kind of the beginning of finding all the character voices. Uh, and keeping track and, and figuring out, okay, how, what makes this woman different from that woman, from that woman, um, you know, part of it is accent. Part of it is what, what are the things that you can do vocally to differentiate that and keep the story going? Because ultimately that's what you're, you're doing. And then with Donald Lee Westlake, I think that the thing that I really appreciated with him more than anything else was his humor mm-hmm. and trying, you know, I think that's the, that's the one thing I really, really try to do is find the humor uh, in books and make sure that it it, it comes alive. Right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when you get, uh, you know, when you get feedback from people say, I drove off the road, you know, I had to pull over to the side of the road, you know, I was laughing so hard. You know, my, my in-laws would, would take some of the Dortmunder series and they were like just park in their driveway and laugh. <laughs> um, and that was partly my goal but it's also that's the writing mm-hmm. um now now when, when when you read a book um when, when you're narrating do you read it before you actually sit down to re- oh, yeah. record it yeah okay um i i read uh when i was first starting out i would actually oftentimes read it more than once or i would read it through once and then and then go back and read the section that i was going to be working on that day um as i would come to it um uh, my approach uh, 
is I read it through once. And when I read it through, the, I, I don't, I, at the most that I do is take a highlighter and I will highlight words uh, that I, you know, if there's some, like if there's a, a description of a voice, I might highlight it just to kind of flag it in my mind um, or highlight a word that I, uh, I'll need to look up. But I try not to interrupt the narrative because the purpose of that first read for my, for me anyway, as, as a narrator is to remember or try to remember what is the emotional connection that I have to this book and, and to the story and recap and try to capture that when I narrate it. Mm -hmm. And so that means I can't be stopping, you know, and, and destroying the kind of the, the freight train, so to speak of what, what the emotional impact of a story is. So I don't want to be slowed down with, uh, you know, taking copious notes about something. It's like, no, because when you're reading, you know, as, as a, as a consumer, you want to be drawn into the story. And that emotional connection is what I'm trying to recreate uh, when I narrate. And so I need to have a clear idea of what that em initial emotional connection is. Uh, and you can't do that if you're, you know, if you're being scientist and kind of dissecting everything right uh, ahead of time. So, yes, I do read it. I mean, it's important for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, especially in fiction, you, you'll need to know, you know, accent wise, oh, this is an Irishman. Uh, and you might not find that out until, you know, chapter six. And you'd hate to have to go back and record the first, you know, five <laughs> chapters of dialogue because, oh, my God, he's Irish, uh, uh, you know, which is, you know, there are stories of that uh, in the Library of Congress. Uh, one, uh, you know, literally on the last page, uh, for some reason, the author included, you know, he said in his Irish brogue, and that was the first mention of his accent. And the narrator was just like, oh, no, because he hadn't <laughs> pre-read. So they had to literally go back and re-record all the dialogue that he had wow. throughout the book. Um, <clears throat> and, and also just to, to get a feel of the story and, I, and, and by story that, that can be, you know, a, nonfiction has a story to tell too. Uh, you know, it's just, they're using different methods to tell that story. And in fact, most of the nonfiction, the most effective nonfiction is the, what is the type that keeps that in mind that they are in fact relating a story because the st stories are how we learn. I mean, it's, it's the, the structure of how we uh, embrace things. You know, if you're told a story, you're going to remember, you know, if you were told a story, you know, two plus two is four or whatever, that, that's a story in and of itself, you know, so that that's how we remember things. Um, and the good writers, the great writers are the great storytellers, and it doesn't matter whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Uh, and they will somehow find a hook, uh, you know, one of the, if you want a page turner, you know, uh, I think it's Robert Caro's, uh, biography four volume biography of Lyndon uh, Baines Johnson is like a, it reads like a page turner because he's a brilliant storyteller um <laughs> among other things you know I just recently did um uh, a book of uh, I think it's Peter Stark's um Astoria which is about uh, kind of the opening of the northwest and it, again it reads it's it's an amazing tale uh and he writes it like a, you're reading a thriller um so that in that regard, it can be, you have to have a, uh, be able to capture the, the essence of what that story is like. I will answer, there was a, uh, I noticed on one of your uh, shout outs, somebody asked a question, how do you remember the voices or the accents? I don't know that there's a, uh, any particular accent that's um, harder or, or easier. Um, I would say um, Southern accent for me is, Fairly easy, but it, it, again, that will depend on how specific it needs to be. You know, does it need to be Georgian as opposed to Virginian as opposed to, uh, say, Texas? I mean, uh, if it's kind of generic Southern, that's probably the easiest to slip into, partly because uh, living in Washington, D.C. for the last 30 years. Um, yeah, 30 years. Wow. Wow. No, that's not right. 97. No, 81. 30, 30, 30 plus years. Um you you run into a lot of people um, with the southern accent, um, and it is slightly. I mean, it's a southern town, but um, the accent here is. I mean, is not quite that. But the, one of the reasons why southern is a little bit easier is because it slows down, um, and that makes it a, a little bit easier. Just the rhythm of the speech is that way, right? Um, 
ironically, sometimes the Minnesota accent can be a bit tough for me just because I've spent so much time getting rid of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which, you know, which is a, a little bit, but then I get on the phone to my sister or whatever and it's like, okay. And, uh, now we just go for there. Uh, and it's all comes back. Um, I, and with regard to that, um, accents and or character voices, um, you have to have a, a, a strong visual, visualization of the character in your mind. Um, I, I truly believe that, you know, if, if you're not thinking, uh, thinking the image that is being created on the page, you're not communicating it nearly as well. So one of the thing that, things that becomes easier and easier is it's a physical thing that happens when you start doing a character voice because all of a sudden you're going to change your body. Uh, so it's not just a vocal thing that's happening. You, you might, I mean, you, you're not seeing me in the booth in terms of, uh, what, you know, where, where am I putting tension in my body? How am I holding my body? Uh, and, and what image do I have in my head of that character? And so all of a sudden you encounter that character again. And if you, it's kind of like, if you've read it, if you see it, you, um, hear it and then you write it down, you have it memorized. Well, the same thing happens as a narrator. If you, if you've seen it, you've said it and you physically changed yourself as you're saying these lines, it almost puts an indelible, you know, mark in your brain in terms of, Oh, when I come across this character, you know, the voice that they have partly because you've done it so many times. Now that's not to say that in, in like the wheel of time where there were literally thousands of characters, you right. necessarily had, a clear image of every character and you, you kind of like it. There were a certain amount of generic voices that you had, but when you have those strong physical, uh, and, uh, visual images in your head of a character, it gets a lot easier to do the voice. Um, and you kind of depend on, I mean, that's the other thing. I don't, I don't pre plan voices, uh, I mean, you make notes in the sense of, okay, this is, you know, it's an older character or you, you'll hear, you'll see a description, uh, by the author and okay, you'll have to pay attention to that. But I don't try out voices ahead of time, so to see, you know, and go, oh, this is what, it, partly because it's like you let the texts speak to you. And now, you know, having done it so many times over the course of so many years, it's, it's, that's, I trust that process within myself. Um, but, uh, you, you really do. There's kind of an alchemy that happens, um, between the author, the words on the page and you and your voice. Um, and you'll feel it, uh, when it's right. Um, and you'll definitely feel it when it's wrong. Uh, there's, there's just something that that's the wrong voice for this character. And you, you'll go back. Okay. I have to stop. I have to go back and, and, and rethink this, but that happens very infrequently. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's partly just the experience. Um, but getting back to <laughs> Donnelly Westlake real quick, um, what was great about his writing is a, it's very humorous, but it, it really ran the gamut because the Richard Stark stuff that he wrote was very noir, very dark. And so there was a flatness to it, uh, and a, and a, gr a, a grit to it. But all of a sudden you'd have this character who was really a clown and you're like, oh, how do I deal with that? And you realize, no, you know what? It all fits together into the fabric. And I'm going to use fabric is actually a, uh, a metaphor I have in my head sometimes of the story. Um, and so you can put all these different things because every story to a certain degree and to use the fabric metaphor is like a quilt. And you're patching it together. And this section might be a, this square of the quilt might be a silky, satiny kind of section. And then all of a sudden the next square is some rough wool tweed or whatever that you're, that you're now. And how do I stitch those things together? How do I make them flow? And th that's what the writer has done. Um, and your job is to make those textures and that surface and that color come alive. Uh, and so it doesn't all have to be, you know, just because the first square was satiny doesn't mean the second square is going to be satiny or the third square or the 10th square or the 15th square. It can be many, many different squares put together here. 
And so it opened my mind to that, oh, I don't have to live in one kind of state for a story. I can actually expand it um, to many different states um, of being, so to speak. And that kind of changed or very, were very much influenced um, how I would approach a story and, uh, uh, and opened my mind to that possibility. Um, and then you have, the th I think the, the one thing, you know, we've done a lot, my wife and I, uh, Kate Redding, um, her, that's, her, that's her book name, uh, so to speak. And, and I have done a lot of stuff together the uh, Wheel of Time series and now uh, some stuff for like B. E. Schwab and, and Brandon Sanderson. And those are long, long books. And it's a different approach to it um, because, you know, you're, you're reading it. Yes, you're reading it in chunks. You know, you're, no one's listening to it in a 24-hour sitting. You know, it's like, okay. Uh, but it's a different style of storytelling than, say, uh, you know, an essay on uh, reactionary politics, Um and so you approach it in a different way. Uh, one of the greatest things that happened to me was um, having to re-record The Call of the Wild. Um, uh, I remember this. Uh, this was probably about, oh, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was fairly early. So I would say, you know, in the late 90s or middle 90s. And I had done, um, I had recorded the book. I thought he did a good job. And the producer came back and said, um, listen to this. And he made me listen, and certain things were popping. And to use my quilt metaphor, it's like there were all these ties that I was putting into a quilt, and they're necessary to a certain degree, but they're not constant. And, and what I realized I was doing, I was, I was hitting too many words. Uh, and I was, uh, the, the story was bumping along as opposed to flowing along. And so I actually re-recorded it, but it was just a great reminder. And this was one of the, the hard things about, um, audio narration can be that, uh, you're getting, you get very little feedback at times. Um, uh, you have, you know, you have an engineer, some uh, in, if you're doing, you know, a, a, a real front end book, you know, you might have a director, but a lot of times it's just you and the microphone and the book. And especially in the last, you know, 15 years, as, as the technology has changed, it's literally just you and the technology and the book. Mm -hmm. And to know when you're being effective as a, as a narrator is important. And, and it's hard to come by that information, uh, because we weren't, you know, it is, it, back in the old days, you, you weren't, you can't just call up, you know, Amazon or, or Audible and look at, you know, the comments from people. And comments are, you know, the comments are interesting in that, you know, you can have back to back comments. He was monotone. He made the story come alive. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, which, which was it? Uh, and it's probably a bit of both. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, Part of, of what I try to do, the, another metaphor I have in my head sometimes when I approach a book is uh, you are the camera in the film. And there are times when you need to do a jump cut and there are times when, when the picture, the image that's happening is a slow, gradual fade in or a close, you know, close up, whatever. It's how, how are you bringing people into the story? Because to a certain degree, your voice, the words are the story, are, are the camera. So, you know, it is, is the, does the author want you to be jumping from point of view to point of view rapidly, like a, like a, like the camera would all of a sudden focus on this close up and then go to that close up and jump cut? Or, or do they want a panoramic view where you're gradually being invited into this and then the things that, and then gently kind of lift out the things that they want you to be noticing? The way a film, you know, it's like we're going to just put the focus here. And then there, and it's more of a gentle flow to it. And those are things uh, you you kind of well, the writing will will lead you in terms of that and tell you, you that's not something you impose on the writing. Uh, that can be a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but that's that's kind of the approach that that you have to take. And so for a while, especially these, you know, like uh, I'm working on right now. I'm working on. Um, 
James Islington's second book in, in his uh, Lycanus trilogy, uh, Echo of Things to Come, and it's 838 pages long. Wow. Um, so there's, there's a, uh, you know, as, as a listener, you can't live, at, at, you're not going to live at that high intensity uh, emotional state for 838 pages. You'll be dead. Um, I'll, I'll be dead. Um, uh, uh, and that's not what he's trying, you know, that's what he's trying to do. So it's like, okay, build it up, you know, lay the groundwork so that eventually, and this is what Brandon Sanderson does so well, uh, you know, he will, uh, you know, there's the story just builds and builds and builds and builds. And all of a sudden you, it feels like it's an avalanche by the end. Um, but the, the, the snow has to fall down first, uh, onto the mountains, so to speak. Um, how did you get involved with um, Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time and then also Brandon Sanderson? How, how did that come about? Um, when they uh, – Books on Tape was the original uh, owner of the rights, and my wife and I both worked for them. And, and back in those days, the technology was such that uh, I think we were still recording on ADAP. Um, ADAP for people uh, – uh, when we when I first started out, we were actually recording on reel to reel, and then they would transfer that to uh, uh, we would transfer it to a cassette. They would transfer the cassette to uh, uh, wide, you know, a, a, another kind kind of tape, and then that's how they would mass produce it. Uh, so you're talking about generational loss in terms of sound quality. To improve the sound quality, they went to DAT. Well, DAT, if you are aware of DAT recorders, was um, uh, has a very narrow, narrow bandwidth, and it was really made only to store computerized information, so uh, not not the voice. Um, and the problem with DAT was that if the tape was bad at all, all of a sudden, literally, you could have garbage. Uh, you'd be reading a sentence, and then because of, the, of something on the physical tape itself, you would lose a sentence or something because it would, just, it would become noise. Mm -hmm. um, um, but the the vocal quality was, you know, you lost all the tape hiss because there was, uh, you know, virtually no tape hiss. Well, to improve on the tape, they switched to uh, essentially uh, what they called ADAT, which divided a, a VHS tape. So, was, you know, back in the day when you got, used to get VHS tapes, you know, for your movies or whatever, they would divide that into eight tracks and you recorded on those eight tracks. Um, and then again, the tape, was improved it was cheaper and whatever so we were still recording on i believe adat at that time but that's linear um and the issue becomes it's hard to um splice that to edit that because you're not looking at sound waves on a computer you're looking at tape so my wife and i you know obviously we lived together and we had a studio i i mean i'm that's part of it um and i also think uh my both of our experience in doing big books had been positive for them. So they came to us and, and asked to us, you know, would you like to do this? And we said, sure, why not? Um, and I'm thinking, oh, great. You know, I think the first book was, I don't know, 700 pages or something like that. I was like, great, this is fantastic. And it's a series. So, wow, perfect. Um, and uh, little did I realize that the first book, I think, is 640 pages of male point of view and 40 pages of women's point of view. And I was like, well, that's a great divide. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> um, um, but because we could literally, you know, when we were recording it, if you came to, you know, we could switch off by just, you know, walking in, walking out. So in a purely kind of um, mechanical way, it made sense to have two people who were together to record it uh, or narrate it. Um, and little did we know how well, I had no idea about the books before I started reading them. You know, I had, uh, I had that they were as popular as they were. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we both love, uh, to narrate that kind of stuff. It's just fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and there is a glossary, I think in the first book and it had maybe, I don't know, a hundred terms or whatever, but, Rapidly, there's all these other characters and names and things coming up. And so I can remember calling Robert Jordan up um, early on saying, um, 
we can, you know, I can, I can call you every time I come across a name because at this point, uh, the internet was, you know, we're talking pre internet kind of thing. So I can call physically call you every time I come across a character who has a different name that we don't have a pronunciation for, or you can just, you know, trust us to come up with a name that kind of follows your pronunciation uh, guide, so to speak, that you kind of is pretty clear from the way your, your glossary is laid out in terms of how you want things to be pronounced. And that was our last com- conversation with him with regard to how things <laughs> should be pronounced. Literally, he said, fine, go ahead and do that. Um, and so we, you know, started to attack that series. Um, and, uh, it was just fun. Um, the, now the, one of the great things about doing that was we had the first five books, uh, in a, in a one fell swoop. So it wasn't like what's happening now where, you know, it's been two years since I've done, uh, you know, a uh, shadow of what was lost for James Islington. Uh, and, um, you know, the V.E. Schwab book, it had been two or three years since we had done a gathering of shadows. Um, <clears throat> so you it was very easy to keep track of characters at first because, well, I just did it, you know, last week or two weeks ago or a month ago, not three years ago. Right. Uh, and, and, and then we started, we were started realizing very quickly, Oh my God, we need to keep uh, a, a Bible on this. So we started, uh, literally keeping character lists um, with pronunciations. Uh, and it was quite a tome uh, in and of itself uh, by the end of the, the series. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that happened was, well, when when, when Robert passed away, um, we were like, oh, that's too bad. Uh, not knowing that if anybody was, was ever going to finish it. And then um, I think it was two or three years after he had died that, that uh, they made the decision uh, to have Brandon finish it. Mm-hmm. And um, and so part of it was trying to remember, oh my God, it's been three years since we've done any of this. Now, granted, at that point we had done, what, 10 of the books or 11 of the books. So it wasn't like, you know, uh, they were strangers, but um, we weren't that familiar with them. And then... Uh, one of the things that happened was um, before we got, before Brennan had finished uh, the the last, what became three volumes of The Wheel of Time, they said, well, yeah, and we're going to record, um, he's got another series uh, that we're going to try to do before that uh, to just get it out there, um, which was Mistborn. Mm-hmm. Um, and the unique thing about Mistborn <coughs> was that um, they sent me volume three to do first. Oh, really? Yeah. Which was a real challenge because I hadn't read volumes one or two. No one had, or at least maybe, well, maybe they had. I don't know. I, did, I, I didn't have them. So I'm narrating characters, and I have no idea how they should sound uh, and how, you know, in terms of that. So it was a real, it was one of those things where uh, I made some uh, inferences into how to approach the character voices for that based on the writing. And I think virtually everything turned out really, really nicely. But it was an interesting experience to record the end of the trilogy first and then go back and do books one and two. Um, just, And I'm not sure why they wanted him uh, done that way, but, you know, ours is not to question why. Ours is but to speak and die. Uh, right. uh, but, it, it, uh, and, and I love Brandon's stuff. Um uh, you know, uh, the Bands of Mourning is up for an Audi again this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I had so much fun with that book. Oh, my God. Uh, and it's interesting because I really, uh, I enjoy his humor. Um, at times, you know, it, it, it's silly, but it, it is a, a bit P.G. Woodhouse um, uh, at times. And... Uh, it, it's just a lot of fun. And then he can also, you know, he has that wonderful ability to kind of then wrap it up, ramp it up into, you know, action sequences. And uh, and the thing I notice about virtually all of the uh, the science fiction, call it science fiction, fantasy writers, is that it, they're always dealing with a moral issue. Um, they're, and, and I think that's... Um, 
at base, they're, 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 the, the good ones are struggling around the question and they're not answering it necessarily. And that's not their job. And they don't feel compelled to do that. Um, but they are making sure the question gets asked. Um, and that it's out there. And whether that's, you know, whether that's V. Schwab or, um, or, uh, you know, Islington or Jacob Cooper or, uh, you know, there's, there's, there are lots of questions, uh, moral questions. And in, and in light of today, that becomes even more, you know, in, in light of today's political uh, situation, those, those questions need to be asked. Um, and fantasy oftentimes is, is trying to strip away some of the emotional kind of uh, blocks to looking at the question in a different light by making it a world where you don't have that same emotional attachment um, that you do to things uh, in, in this world, so to speak. Um, so you can actually see the question in a, in a, in a clearer light, maybe. <coughs> um, but uh, that's the involvement with Robert Jordan, I think, like I say, was partly a mechanical thing at, at first, but also the fact that uh, my wife and I had, had done books of that length and, and with that kind of breadth of characters and handled them well. Um, it's, you know, audiobooks are, uh, as a narrator, there's, there's so many different ways you can do it. And I often look at it as a, I use a, a musical metaphor in the sense that, uh, some, some narrators have one instrument, but they can, you know, it's like Yo-Yo Ma plays the hell out of a cello mm-hmm. and he can make that cello talk in ways that, you know, other musicians couldn't dream. Other musicians in the, you know, might have a four piece combo. And so they can do things, uh, you know, whether it's, you have a facility for character voices or you have a facility for this or that, um, that, okay, so I've got a bass, a guitar, drums and a piccolo. All right. So I can make an arrangement. I use that arrangement to tell the story. Uh, other people only have brass or, or they might only have strings or whatever. Um, you can always, you know, and it's, it is like listening to the same piece of music with a different arrangement, uh, musical arrangement, because you, you know, that, that was one of the things we encountered when, when we started working on the Robert Jordan is, you know, my wife's instrument is very different from my instrument. And, and so, to imitate each other would have been disastrous because it's like, you know, uh, the trumpet can't, you know, be a, a violin, but what can each of them do to, to express that same piece of music and make it effective? And that's kind of the, uh, the metaphor, I guess I use, um, to approach, you know, when you are approaching it, it's like, you have to understand what you are physically, uh, capable of, uh, as you approach a book. And the, there really is, um, I have to say, there really is a, you, you feel a, a huge responsibility to the author. Uh, this is their baby. And you are trying to assert, you're trying to illuminate it, you know, trying to, to bring it to life as best you can and trying to get out of the way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you want to disappear. You know, you, it really, you, you really are. Uh, as a narrator, for the, at least both my wife and I have this feeling of you're you're the storyteller, but it's the story that's important, and it's not important. You know, I mean, granted, for my my bank account, it's great that you know, yeah, <laughs> that they recognize that you can tell the story well, but you really want the story to be the thing that sells. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and that in that case, it's like, and it's get out of the way of it. Make it make it as clear as possible. You are the lenses that people are seeing that piece of uh, of art through, and so it's like get out of the way. Um, and and so most of your choices, you know, a, a choice. For, do you use an extreme character voice on this on a line? And part of that has that has to do with knowing the story. Is this a plot driven story where we want to call attention to this guy's peculiarities or is it no he's he's uh he's a plot device and we want to stay focused on the next thing you know in terms of film it's like do you all of a sudden you know depict this 
security guard in glaring lights so you can, you know, see all the noses, the hair noses and all that. It's like, or do you just flash across him? You see his badge and you just keep going. Oh, that's what he is. That's how he fits into this. And so vocally, those are choices that you're making. It's like, what kind of focus do I need to give this in terms of how this writing, this particular section of writing works within the context of the whole story? Mm Mm-hmm. Now is now is your uh, is your recording process different when you record with your wife? You, um, yeah, is it, is the process that much different when you're recording by yourself versus with her? Um, there is a certain amount of uh, of I guess parleying, so to speak. Uh, you know, of negotiate not negotiation, but just discussing. Um, it. It, it not the it doesn't change a whole lot um i think we tend to share if if you've come across a character first you tend to to share that because as the narrator of that particular section you're going to be paying more close attention to the actual uh words and the qualities uh than say someone who encounters that character you know, uh, three chapters from now and, and they're not going to have the benefit necessarily of having paid that close attention to the description that has been provided for them. Um, but for the most part, uh, we trust each other, uh, and and other than giving each other, Oh, this is, uh, what, what, what are they like? Oh, Oh, right. Um, there, there isn't, because we have such different instruments, there isn't, um, uh, any kind of real, like oh I did it you know I did it this way and then and then trying to imitate that um, it's more a question of how does how do they fit into the story and uh, I think we both trust each other with regard to oh we you know you know how to interpret a text and you know how to read um, and you're going to do it your way and that's going to be right for your section of the book um, so there isn't a whole lot that's different um, it. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I would say. Okay, that yeah. sounds good. Yeah. Um, of all the, I mean, you've done numerous books. Has there been one character that sticks out the most to you that was just they were the most fun character to to voice? Um, oh, there's so many voices. There's so many characters that I really, really love. I can't, I can't say that there's one. Uh, you know, uh, there's a, a whole range. I mean, I, the the bad news. Uh, by Donald E. Westlake has got some of my favorite characters, but there's nothing. Some of them are extreme, but some of them are not. You know, Andy Kelp was just this kind of optimistic, quirky guy that I loved doing his voice. Um, certainly in the Stormlight Archive, uh, Rock and Lopin uh, are, are so much fun to, to do. Uh, I tend to, tend to like the humorous voices. Um, with the uh, Circle of Rain, there was a character in there uh that I hadn't done since, oh, maybe 15 years ago. That I was like, oh, oh, I know this guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, there, there, there really isn't, um, I, I would say, you know, it, uh, you know, Matt was fun to do in uh, the wheel of time just because of the, uh, the, that kind of frustrating, <laughs> uh, indignant frustration that he was so capable of that the things didn't go his way. Uh, oh, uh, I take that back. Uh, well, no. And then the, the, in the, the Mike Carey series, uh, um, Juliet was, was the, the succubus was just so much fun. And, uh, and, and the other demon demon do, that's one of the great things when you do, when you do, uh, uh, fantasy and, and macabre stuff, it's like the, you get to go there. Loyal, I mean, my God, loyal in um, Wheel of Time. They're, uh, there's no, they're all people you really, really love um, and you can fully embrace. And and because you're in a genre that isn't necessarily tied to the earth, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, you get to go there uh, and really kind of play with that. And, you know, uh, well, part of my, my background is waking up at 6.30 in the morning on a Saturday, you know, through most of my college career and watching Bugs Bunny because that was when it was re-airing back then and just Mel Blanc um, and and the crazy voices he would, you know, it's, uh, that he would find and use. And it's like, yeah, and he's brilliant. 
at it and and the timing that he achieved and that's one voice and he's doing you know he's doing Daffy Duck and he's doing Yosemite Sam and he's doing Bugs and he's doing The Martian and he's doing you know all these different and you know Sylvester and Tweety and Grandma and uh, you know uh, all these fantastic things so uh, I I've fallen in love with too many different people to say that there's one favorite okay um, now um what made you or no you cuz you talked about it earlier uh, but when when you were growing up uh in school were were you in drama did you do acting and that just led into you narrating audiobooks um a little bit um you know i grew up in a, a very rural area i think there was a, a, a an an acting troupe that came to our grade school which had all of about 60 students in it at the time um so i was almost homeschooled uh <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, but I didn't see my first professional play until, uh, I was a junior in college. Oh, okay. Uh, I did, uh, I, I acted in two high school plays, um, and I was, I was active a, a little bit in junior high. Um, uh, what I was, was a reader. I loved to read. I still love to read. It's, you know, uh, my idea of vacation is find a beach and a book uh, and a beer. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can, that's what I do on vacation. It's, it's, uh, I love to read. Um, and uh, all things, you know, it, whether it's, you know, Destiny Disrupted, which is about, you know, the Muslim, uh, the empires of the world, or, uh, you know, if it's, uh, uh, some the newest fiction it's it's i I just love to read um and that's actually helped me i did you know i as an actor you really need to be an actor in the sense that it 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 just allows you if you you want to use the musical metaphor it teaches you how it teaches you music um so you learn how to to uh, you know college uh, acting is is how you learn to use your body and your voice to you know embody a character uh to tell a story so in that regard, acting, I think, is is very helpful as a career uh, instruction, so to speak, to get into the business. It doesn't have to be. I, I know uh, several very good narrators who, d- who don't come from an acting background, but that's very, very rare. Um, just because, especially in the fiction world, you're asked to do uh, so many different things, and that falls right into your, you know, your wheelhouse. Uh, um, I did, you know, I, I majored in in theater essentially in in college, and then I got a, a MFA in directing. Um, but I, you know, as as an actor, uh, every time you enter a play, it's like, okay, this is a graduate class, and today we're going to be studying death, or we're going to be studying grief, or we're going to be studying uh, whatever the you know, themes are in the play. Um, and that's the other thing is I I love to learn. Uh, um, and so part of it is just a, an eternal curiosity in terms of, of you know, the, the, the saying, you know, too many books, too little time is so true for me because I just, I want to read, I want to read, I want to read. Um, and, and the other thing I think, uh, in terms of what really changed some of my stuff and my interest was having to read to my kids. I say having, uh, uh, getting to read to my kids, mm-hmm. um, uh, reading, Stories to my son when he was six months old, um, you know, stories like uh, Burple, uh, you know, it's like here's a turtle, you know, and, and even those, you know, simple stories. But and that's the thing, you know, when you're in front of a microphone and you have the book there, you forget that there's a person that's going to be hearing this and they're right there. And so I know I know some narrators who actually put a picture on the other side of their microphone of the people that they want to think in terms of reading the book. Um so that they remind themselves, it isn't just me and this piece of print and a microphone. It's that person who is hearing it, and how are they reacting it, and visualizing that uh, that inflects how they tell the story. Um, and it's that that can be very, very valuable um, because ultimately, you know, it's very interesting. One time, someone came up and said, "I cheat." Uh, you know, I, I listened to this book, and it's like you didn't cheat. But remember, books books are cheating. The the act of listening to a story is the er, is the is the is the primary thing that happened. Books are actually uh, an abstraction of that. 
So the fact that you're listening to a story as opposed to uh, reading it from a book, you're, that's 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 a, a, a step away from the original. Um, because originally we told stories to each other across the fire. You know, it's like you know that's how stories get related. Uh, it's it's through the human voice. It's through that contact. So don't ever feel you're cheating by listening to an audio book. If you find it more enjoyable, great. You, you know. Some people have prefer to, you know, read print or whatever. And that's, that's great too. But, um, don't, you know, my feeling is never apologize for listening to, you know, saying I listened to the book as opposed to I read the book because you, you are getting the story the way in in a way, uh, in a more primary way than, uh, picking it up from the, from the print. Um, you know, and, and to a certain degree, that's, you know, the great thing is, it used to be that if you were a storyteller, you had to come up with the story. And so I don't know that I could do that. Um, but the storyteller also had to be able to relate the story. And there are a lot of authors who um, wouldn't necessarily be able to do what I do. Um, and that's not to take anything away from either of us. It's just that now we have the benefit of someone who can do one thing and someone who can take that thing and make it into what it can be. Uh, and that's just a, it's a, a really fascinating art form in that regard. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you, you said that, uh, well, you mentioned earlier that, that you are reading the Stormlight Archive um, by Brandon Sanderson. Now those books are, you mentioned they're long. Um, the Way of Kings is 45 hours and Words of Radiance is 48. We We only get to hear your final product, but how much time that we don't see goes into recording um a book a book yeah, yeah. not not just that that series but just mm -hmm. a book. yeah no it, it generally uh, uh the ratio of studio time to finished product is two is you you shoot for 2 to 1 um so 2 minutes in the studio will result in 1 minute of actually finished product okay uh that does not include your research that does not include uh, your pre-read. Um, and that is an optimal. I mean, and, and I would say that that happens for me very rarely um, because you have to be very familiar with the characters. Um, you have to be... Uh, and your, your, your mental syntactic rhythm has to be uh, aligned with the author's syntactical rhythm. Uh, and by that, I mean... It, it, uh, the biggest contrast would be say pick up a 19th century book and start reading it and realize oh my god it's just the structure of these sentences is very different than what we expect today the writing styles have changed well every writer has his own particular kind of idiosyncratic uh, uh, way of writing and every reader has his way idiosyncratic way of reading um, and so when those two things align it's like butter when when they don't, it can be very difficult. That's not to say that it's not great. Um, it's just that sometimes your inner syntactical rhythm as a reader is not necessarily the same as the author's. Uh, and, and so it's like, okay, now how do I change that? How do I get that, make that happen? And so oftentimes it becomes more like two and a half, three. And then when you throw into like uh, a book that will be coming out very shortly called Defeating Isis, um, which is loaded with Arabic um, and foreign names. Um, you're, you know, if I was an, a native Arabic speaker, uh, that would be one thing, um, but I'm not. And so you're encountering names uh, and languages that you're not used to speaking. And so it becomes, that slows you down too. Mm -hmm. um, so then you're talking about three and four and five minutes to get one minute done. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so in a book, say like, uh, uh, Way of Kings, which was 45 hours, at least 90 hours in the studio, I would say probably closer to uh, 120. Oh, wow. Um, just because, you know, uh, and that's the other thing that has really changed in the industry. When I first started, we would get we would get books that had already been published, uh, usually uh, in a bestseller, they would make the audio and shoot to get the audio out maybe six months after the print version went. And the thinking was, well, we want people to buy the print version first, and then, you know, the audio can follow. Well, as the audio market 
uh, geared up and people realized, well, there are some people that they only, only read books by listening to the audio and they want it now, not, you know, six months after people have stopped talking about the book. They want it when they're talking about the book so they can talk about the book. So now they release the audio versions in most cases simultaneously with the print version. Mm-hmm. And the trick there is, you know, it's easy to fix, um, corrections on a print version up to the day before you go to the printer. It's not the same. Uh, so we're dealing with galleys oftentimes that are still being edited. Um, and that's a challenge just as a, as a reader, when you, when you're encountering, um, when you're encountering sentences that aren't quite sentences yet, (laughs) uh, because the, you know, that an an editor is going to go in there and fix that, or there's just a typo and, and, uh, and I do think in the world of editing, uh, spell check is a wonderful thing in terms of making sure that, that every word that's on the page is a, is a correctly spelled word. It's not necessarily the word that was intended, um, but it's a word. Uh, so, you know, if it's than and it should be that, well, both of those are words, but one makes the sentence make sense and one doesn't. Right. Um, and, and that's a, and so that's a challenge, um, so, because now we're we're not getting the galleys. You know, you're getting you're getting the, the galley with maybe a week to prepare it, maybe, and then you have uh, sometimes a week to two weeks to turn it around, um, and that's that's a push. Um, the one thing I will say in terms of recording books, um, it's not your voice that goes first, uh. Although that does happen, especially when you've chosen some you know, some character voices that are are particularly tough on your voice, that can that can you know wipe you out for a day. But but you, your concentration goes before your voice will go in most cases, just because it's you have to think of it in terms of if it is a musical metaphor, so to speak. Musicians don't play for four hours at a crack, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, they they just don't. You they don't have the concentration to do that, and that's what you're doing. Because every every sentence is a piece of melody, and you're you're inflecting it, you're you're you know tying it into the other sentences around it, uh, and to, to form that wonderful paragraph, and then that paragraph into a story, and that's hard mental work more than anything else, and and that's why more than anything your concentration goes you start to make stupid mistakes, and or you start to make tired decisions, and tired decisions can you you tell you can tell. Um, when that starts to happen, because all of a sudden it becomes rote. Um, and that's deadly. Uh, sometimes rote is right, but, but very rarely. Uh, and so your, your concentration is the first thing to go. So in terms of actual, I mean, there are some people who will say you can, you can record four or five hours a day. I I mean, that's your, your finished product. I can't do that. Uh, if I get three hours done, that's a whole lot, and I would probably be exhausted the next day. I tend to try to get more in the in the two hour range per day. Okay. Um, and 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 amazingly, the one thing you really need more than anything else is sleep. If you get good sleep, you can your concentration is that much better. Um, uh, and that's you know it's it's that's just the way it is. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the first questions uh, I got when I announced I was going to be interviewing you was from Josh Hayes over at Keystroke Medium. And he wants to know probably what everybody wants to know. And is that, will you have Oathbringer done when it releases in November? Um, yes, we will. Awesome. If, 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 if they stay on schedule, I don't, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, and that's because Brandon has got so many different things going. Um, uh, and he's so good about his, I mean, he he has a wonderful uh, group of people supporting him in terms of uh, keeping track of the stories and the characters. Uh, it's great to work with him and with regard to if you have. I mean, and he's very particular about pronunciations. So uh, he has a number of assistants who you you fire in a question, and within half an hour you're getting a response in terms of how how it should be handled. Oh wow. Um, and uh, just a question of whether or not uh, he's actually done with the writing by then, because he's got, I don't know, a whole bunch of different things that he's working on. Um, I mean, he the way he, I don't know how he can get, how he finds the time to write, given his <laughs> schedule. Because, I mean, literally, he's got 
you know, he's he's got Mistborn going. He's got the he's talking about having another arithmetist book uh, out at some mm-hmm. point. Um, he's got the Stormlight Archive. He's got uh, Steelheart, uh, which I'm not familiar with. Uh, I think he's talking about expanding Warbreaker um, and possibly uh, Elantris. Uh, you know, and and then there was another. I forget another project that he was doing, which is unrelated to all of that. Um, and, and then he's going on, you know, book tours to, uh, to promote all of this stuff. And he's, you know, one, if you, if you ever get a chance to, if he comes in your area, he's great. I mean, we went to, he was in, in our area, uh, for a book signing. And I think this is, oh, this is when, um, uh, memory of light came out and I, uh, we were there, we were there for three hours. He was there for until I think one o'clock in the morning signing books. Wow. Um, so, you know, he's very generous. Uh, with his time uh, but you know that also means that uh, when do you write yeah. uh, uh, but yes uh, Oathbringer is is on um, I can tell you I, I think right now I'm working on uh, th- uh, Echo of Things to Come which is a number two you know the uh, second book in the Lacanus trilogy for James Islington and then Jacob Cooper is madly trying to finish uh the second book in the um, Dying World Chronicles, the successor to uh, Circle of Rain. So that'll be coming out uh, in, uh, I, I'm not sure when he's, uh, I was just talking to Jacob, but I'm not sure if he has a, a firm date on when he's projecting to finish. And then uh, Rich Restucci uh, and the, all of the, uh, the zombie books, uh, uh, there's so much fun to do um, the, the chaos theory, conspiracy theory. And I forget what the, the name of the next one is, but um, uh, that will be coming out, I think in either late May or, or early June. Um, so yeah, sequels are, 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 are us, so to speak. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's funny. Um, I had uh, another uh, fan. He's also an author, Terry Maggart. Uh, he wanted to know, how did you read the conclusion of the story of World War II without having a nervous breakdown? Um, I, I I can't recall the end of that um, off the top. Although I think I think that was Senator Inouye. Um, uh, it just I, I love that book just because it, it, it was a different side. I've, I've read a number of books on World War II and and just the kind of personalization and the front line kind of perspective of of what that book was about, uh, was very different, um, than others. But I, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly which, which story he's referring to. I, I, I'm back. That's the one by Donald, uh, Donald L. Miller. Okay. No, I, I know the book he talks about. I just, I don't recall the end of it that clearly because I know that part of it was, uh, was, you know, in the last, literally in, in the, like the last, as the, as the war is wrapping up, uh, um, a later center in Senator in a ways, uh, unit from Japan or from Hawaii was fighting in Italy. Um, and they were, they were tasked with fighting, with taking this impossible cliff, uh, you know, mountain stronghold. And if that's what he's referring to, it's like, I met Senator in a way. I, I, one of my first jobs in Washington was actually working with the office of Senate parking. Um, and I got to meet Senator in a way because he was a good friend of the director of the, the office that I worked for. Um, and, uh, it was, that, that book was, it was a, it was a very interesting look at, at that and, and, and the kind of walking through the trenches and not necessarily being aware of the bigger picture, but just the kind of day to day and the, the, and the, the sacrifice that those men and women made was quite amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, here at 30 Minute Author Interviews, we like to end each podcast episode with a segment that we call the legendary ending. Um, so these are kind of book related, not book related questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one is um, What book would you love to have the chance to narrate and why? Well, the, the book that I really wanted to narrate, I got a chance to. I got to do Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, that was uh that's been my bible uh, since, since college um uh since i mean other than that oh god um hmm, a number of them i've done uh, i got to do Cormac mccarthy's the road and i got to do uh i got to do uh 
Arch of Triumph. Um, uh, boy. <laughs> I, no, it, it, I, I've been very blessed in yeah. a lot of the books that I would, you know, part of it is I, I have been exposed to books that I never would have read. Um, uh, but I, you know, that was my job to do it. And it's like, oh, my God, this is a great book. Uh, and then uh, I'm at the point now, like with the Library of Congress uh, talking books program, or I can come across a book and say, uh, is, is this book in our, in our, you know, library? And if it's not, I can say, uh, I think it should be and make a case for it. And, and I want to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, oh, you know what? Uh, and I had the chance to do this and I, uh, I, they, I couldn't do it. Um, I, I think, and I would, I, I probably would want to learn French in order to do it. Um, but war and peace. Okay. I, I was offered it, uh, at the library of Congress and there was a new translation and, uh, I had to turn it down because I was too busy and they needed it in a, a, a sooner turnaround, but it was, uh, those great Russian, well, the, any when you get into those books that that deal in those questions, that would that would be the one. Okay. Now the next question is, if you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse, which one of the book characters that you've had the chance to narrate would you want to be stuck with, and why? Felix Castor. Oh, Felix Castor. <laughs> which uh, which book series is he from? He's from the. Uh, well, it's the. Uh, uh, well, it's the Felix Castro series. He's okay. in the the the, uh, the the first of which is the Devil You Know, uh, by Mike Carey. Um, yeah, he's a, he's an exorcist, uh, and he's dealing with with uh, the, the zombies in his world are different than zombies in our world. Um, uh, but um, but yeah, no, Fix is great. Okay. He's he's very snide. He's very snarky. He's got a a, a very uh, jaundiced kind of attitude toward life. That works. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse, but you could choose any character from any kind of media source, who would you want to be stuck with and why? Uh, um, probably Andy Kelp from from um, the Dortmunder series. Andy is just the, the guy who's like, when he's always an optimist, mm -hmm. always very funny, um, looks out for himself, first of all, but, you know, he's got a good heart. <laughs> <laughs> that, that and, and very funny. Okay. Um, if you had a time machine, where would you travel and why? Oh, I, uh, going back in time would be one thing, but, uh, I, uh, wow. What, what pivotal moment would I really want to be a fly in the wall for? Right. Um, uh, I know. I would want to be a fly on the wall. I want to travel back to the Fifth Crusade, and I want to be on the wall when St. Francis of Assisi is meeting the Sultan of Egypt. Uh, and uh, he's trying to... This is the, the Sultan, who had actually been um, knighted by Richard the Lionhearted of England, if you can believe that. Um, but St. Francis is there to try to convert him, and they spend three days together. And, uh, uh, I would want to, to, and, and he eventually walked away and to a certain degree, uh, Francis's theology with regard to Muslims changed. Uh, and I don't know how it affected the Muslim world, but I would want to be a fly in the wall for that conversation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question is if you had one superpower, what would it be and why? Um, the superpower would be to make sure everybody use the Oxford comma, <laughs> 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 because I think without the Oxford comma, there is so much confusion in writing today. <laughs> and I would want, want to be able to just look at someone and they would have to use the Oxford comma from now on. That would be my superpower. <laughs> that's, that's such a great answer. <laughs> I love it. Um, so the question that we're kind of famous for here is a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say and why is he here? Oh, in light of today's politics, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> right, it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
ah, uh, something <laughs> something along the lines of 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 uh, I'm looking for the wall and and can someone get me an ice cube? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that's that's about as much as I have. <laughs> that, that works. Um, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing, acting, or life, that you would like to share with our listeners? Um, uh, briefly, I will I will say this. This is the I, I love this job. This is this is what I you know I uh, the job that I feel like I was meant to do. And I feel very blessed because so many people don't have that opportunity um, for whatever reason. Uh, and But follow the thing you love, um, whether, it, whether it pays or not, follow the thing you love. It will reward you uh, more than anything else. Uh, it will be a reason to wake up in the morning. Sounds good. And um, for the authors that might be listening, if they would like to have the chance for you to narrate one of their books, um, where do they go and what's the process that they would need to follow? Um, the the easiest way would be to contact us uh, through uh, our Facebook page. It's Michael Kramer and Kate Redding on Facebook, uh, and then just message us. I mean, that's actually how uh, Jacob uh, Cooper got a hold of me. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that's, uh, and, um, that, that's, that's probably the best. Um, you know, uh, other than that, uh, if you're affiliated with a publishing house, um, just have them contact us, um, uh, uh, because uh, we work with any number of, you know, Random House, Macmillan, Simon & Schuster, uh, Tor, uh, There'll be people there that, you know, but, but the, the quickest way would be to contact us through our Facebook page and just message us. Okay. And mm -hmm. wh where can our listeners go if they want to find out more about you and the books that you've narrated? Um, you can go on Audible and, and you can, uh, you, they'll have a whole list. You can go to Audiophile Magazine. They'll have a list, uh, uh, you know, pick a genre. You can also just literally go to uh, Google or Yahoo or whatever and, and type in Michael Kramer and, and or Michael Kramer and Kate Redding audiobooks. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and a whole list should pop up if you're in the, you know, the talking books series, uh, talking books program with the library of Congress, you can easily just go to look up, you know, audiobook narrator and they'll have a whole list of, of things that we've done. And, and I, like I say, I've been very blessed with, um, having a whole bunch of different uh, genres to cover, um, not just, you know, uh, fantasy or humor or whatever. Um, uh, nonfiction as well as fiction, children's as versus, uh, you know, I, I just did the Screenwriter's Bible for the, for the Talking Books program. So if you want to learn how to write a screenplay, uh, there's, your, there's your animal. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, but that, that would be the way to contact us. Well, we will throw links to everything over in the show notes at legendarium.com. Okay. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. Okay. Thank you, Preston. Thank you. Well, everybody, that is all the time we've got for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to 30-Minute Author Interviews. We hope you come back every Wednesday when we have a brand new author interview just for you. And head on over to legendarium.com. That's L E I G H G E N D A R I U M.com. And find the show notes for this episode. And let me know what was your favorite part of this episode. I love hearing what y'all enjoyed about each episode that we do. So head on over to the show notes and let me know. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our sponsors, Serial Box and Galactic Satori Chronicles. Click on their links. And let them know that you heard about them right here on 30 Minute Author Interviews. And we'd also like to thank a few of our Patreon subscribers. We would like to thank Nick Breaker, Diane S. Loftus, Third Scribe, and Maggie Stewart Grant. They are supporting 30 Minute Author Interviews through Patreon. And they're also receiving the very special Patreon only podcast called 10 Questions With. So visit patreon.com slash legendarium and find out how you can support 30-minute author interviews as well. Until next time, stay legendary.
the legendary 30-minute author interviews. I almost had it in one take. <laughs>